Good evening and welcome to uh, Policy Pizza and a Pint uh, on climate change in Manitoba. Uh, Policy Pizza and a Pint is part of our citizen series uh, for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. My name is Robert Ermel and I'm the Director of Operations for the Institute. MIPR seeks to enhance public policy discourse in Manitoba by nourishing dialogue and debate on current and emerging issues facing Manitobans and their governments. Tonight's topic is climate change in Manitoba. Climate change is a global issue with localized effects. It can alter environmental, economic, and social landscapes within the region. What are the current and future impacts of climate change in Manitoba? How will these changes affect the general population? And how can we mitigate and adapt to climate change? Discussing these topics this evening um, are our guests and panelists, Dr. Danny Blair and Joan Perry. Dr. Danny Blair is the Associate Dean of Science at the University of Winnipeg, where he is also a Professor of Geography and, act, and the Acting Principal of the Richardson College for the Environment. His main research interests are climate variability and change in Canada's western interior. He is the Co-Chair of the Steering Committee of the Climate Change Connection, Manitoba's Principal Climate Change Outreach Organization. Our second panelist, Joellen Perry, is the Deputy Director of Climate Change and Energy Interna at the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Her research focus is focused on adaptation to the effects of climate change in developing countries. Within Canada, Ms. Perry undertakes policy research for the Manitoba government to foster efforts to mitigate and adapt to climate change in this province. Our moderator this evening is Mary Agnes Walsh. Mary Agnes uh, joined the Winnipeg Free Press in 2002, first as a general assignment reporter, then covering City Hall and the Manitoba legislature, before moving to her current post as public policy reporter. She tells me she would have been here even if she wasn't moderated because of her interest in this matter. Yeah, one more person in the room. So, um, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, the Pizza Policy in a Pint series has obviously caught on with a, a number of folks, uh, standing room only. So uh, it's a full house. Enjoy the conversation. Enjoy the dialogue. Um, make sure that you've got lots of good questions. And most importantly, from my standpoint, fill out your feedback forms at the end of the evening for other ideas, other things you want to see, and anything we can do better. So thank you for coming, and enjoy the discussion. I'll now pass the mic over to Danny to start off. Thank you very much. And of course, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Alexandra, for uh, organizing this uh, to have me here with uh, Joellen. And thank you, of course, the audience for uh, being here in big numbers to hopefully discuss at, at some length uh, after we speak about this oh so important topic. Those of you who have seen me speak and have known me for a long time know that I have a passion for this topic, uh, especially the science aspect of it. And so that's how I'm going to start off uh, with a little bit of, of the science of it. Um, it's a little bit odd, uh, but it also is a great opportunity to talk about climate change, global warming if you will, at the end of this brutal, brutal winter. Uh, it, it has been, of course, a remarkable winter. I, uh, for the last month, I've had a time-lapse camera going in my backyard to watch the snow melt, and it just disappeared this morning. <laughs> so I had uh, have a really interesting uh, uh, time-lapse of that. But a uh, truly remarkable uh, winter. And, it's, of course, several people, many people have said to me, jokingly, half-jokingly, or not uh, serious at all about, you know, where is your global warming, where is your climate change? Um, and I, my response to that is always, you do not look out your window to see global warming. You do not look out your, into your backyard to see climate change. Uh, absolutely, this winter was brutal, if not only for Winnipeg and most of Canada, uh, but for much of North America. Uh, if you look at the, normally I would have this big 167 set of PowerPoint slides, so I chose not to bring that. But uh, as, as many of you know, I have this, uh, you know, there's lots of imagery out there to show how unusual the climate is over, over periods. And it's really striking how cold North America was this year. It really was. Uh, the, the winter was just brutal. But if you look out beyond the window of North America, you see that March was the fourth warmest March in 130, over 135 year period. So from 1880 to 2014, March was the fourth warmest. December was the fourth warmest, January was the fourth warmest, February was rather cold. It was only the 21st warmest of February. But for most of the world, they're going, what are you talking about? That wasn't really warm in the last few months that we've had. So you, you have to look globally. This is a global phenomenon, and you have to make sure that you distinguish weather from climate. 
and short period chronic variations and variability from change, from long-term change or disruption, as uh, Tom Rand uh, talks about. I just read his book, Waking the Frog, and I recommend it. Uh, and uh, th this is it's a, a surprise to me that the global statistics are so uh, prominent that this we continue to have really warm uh, years. Uh, last year was the eighth warmest year on record. Uh, despite the so-called uh, hiatus, the global warming hiatus or the pause, uh, absolutely there. Uh, well, maybe not ex absolutely. Uh, there are, is some discussion about this, about whether it's more of a statistical error than anything else. The last ten years or so have been a little bit cooler in the sense that we haven't had as much warming over the last uh, ten, uh, ten years or so, or, or, or a little bit more. But this is, this is not surprising to a climatologist like myself. This is the way the climate system works. It goes up, it goes down. It's a very complex system. But it's, it's destined to go up. It would be just an unremarkable thing for not, us not to have to deal with some really significant change because of the, the, the fact that we continue to add enormous amounts of carbon to the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. Last year, you might recall that we passed for the first time in the last 800,000 years at least <coughs> 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 400 parts per million, the average right now is 398 parts per million, so 398 out of every million molecules is carbon dioxide, so it's a trace gas, but it's an oh so important trace gas, it, it has a disproportionate effect on the climate system because of, of its effect and its uh, feedback effects on the radiative processes in the climate system, and I'd love to talk to you and show you slides about the radiative processes and all that. But the, 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 the fact is that adding these greenhouse gases in such large amounts over such a very long time, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, has transformed our, our, our atmosphere in some really important ways. And there is unfortunately uh, no sign to me that, well, there's a few signs. And there's some people in the room who would like to talk about the signs, and maybe Joelle and talk about like that. But to me, it's been really discouraging because we've known about this for a long time. We've been talking about it for a long time, but all of this, all of well, Kyoto and all of this has really done nothing. Has had, has had no real substantial effect on the concentration of carbon dioxide and, uh, and, and the trend towards higher amounts. And in fact, as, uh, as I often show, uh, and as the IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports that are that came out uh, starting last fall, and the latest one just came out a couple of days ago or yesterday on mitigation. Um, as, as they clearly show, we're on, a, on the worst case scenario path in the in the modeling community. The climate models are fed data to figure out what it's going to be like in 30 years, and 40 years, and 300 years. And the data that they're fed is largely controlled by, or the, the path that they define is largely controlled by how much carbon dioxide is assumed to be in the atmosphere next year, and the year after that, and the year after that. And the worst case scenario, or the business as usual scenario, is the RCP 8.5, which means at the end of the century, we'll have eight and a half watts per square meter more energy impinging upon the planet's surface than uh, at the beginning of that process. So what does that mean? 8.5 watts per square meter, 8.5 watts of energy, 8.5 joules per second, every square meter per second for every uh, every square meter for the globe. 8.5, is that a big number? Is it a small number? Think of this. The, uh, the ice ages, uh, the, the, the series of ice ages that ended about 18,000 years ago, from 800,000 years ago to the, to the near present, ice ages were triggered by a drop in the rate of forcing of about five or six watts per square meter. So by processes not related to human activity, of course, you decrease the watts per square meter by about five or six watts per square meter, and you have two kilometers of ice over Winnipeg. You have ice ages. And what we're, we have come out of that, which is why we have this nice policy and climate, but now we're rapidly pushing the system toward, towards having well, we've already reached 2.3, 2.3 extra watts per square meter since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution because of anthropogenic forces, mostly related to carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide. We're at 2.3, and we're, we're on track, unfortunately, to going to eight to eight and a half by the end of the century. And everything that we know about the climate system and have to understand is that that means a truly transformed planet. And so the bottom line is we have to develop policies and uh, processes to stop that from happening. 
we have to somehow bring it down to one of the lower RCPs, 2.6 or 4 or, 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 or 6 at least, so that we don't see the, the destined the, the destiny that eight and a half watts per square meter or a large number of watts per square meter of extra energy triggered by this enhanced greenhouse effect, we just can't go in that direction. Well, we're going to go in that direction. It's going to be so hard for us to reverse it. But we have to do our damnedest soon to reverse it, to, or to slow it down and stop emitting carbon dioxide. And this means enormous change, not only to Manitoba and Canada, but for the world. Somehow we have to get our act together to realize that there's something really serious going on. And I would argue that the vast majority of the population, even in, in Manitoba and Canada, don't really understand that. And they don't necessarily have to understand the science. I would like them to understand the science and scientists, of course. But everybody has to appreciate that there's something going on that is really important. Well, there, there are so many things to, to talk about in that regard. One of them is that, unfortunately, uh, the things that we can do, uh, you and me, and you know, us middle-aged, younger, older people, the, 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 uh, I'm not looking at anybody in particular, but the, uh, what, we, what we do today or over the next few years isn't going to help us. Uh, that is, it takes a long time for the system to change. And so the, the investments that we make the, the things that we need to do soon. Every year of delay, every year of denial, every year of delay in particular is making it worse and worse and worse. Uh, the things that we need to do uh, soon aren't really gonna pay off for us, but they're gonna pay off for your kids and their kids and their kids. And that's, that's generally the mantra that climatologists use. D uh, don't discount the future. Don't say that it's not my problem or it'll somehow fix itself. We have to not discount the future because that future is your kid's future. Their kids and their kids and their kids and their kids. And further on. So the, we just have to get our heads around that. We, we have to stop denying it. We have to deal with it, the reality of it. We have to accept it and we have to move on as quickly as possible. And we can't do it individually. Manitoba can't do it by itself. Canada can't do it by itself. We have to do it collectively. And that is a big task. And that's where we turn to people like Joelle and, and others to weave their magic to develop policy that spreads like a virus around the world and uh, get it done. But we just, we just have to. And I know there's some people in the room who have really good ideas about, uh, about how to do that, starting locally and having it spread like a virus, the transition movement. Uh, that, that absolutely has to happen. But it's uh, not looking good right now. And hopefully it will look better soon. So with that intro, I will uh, pass it on to Joelle and see what she has to say.